Life of Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Chapter 5, Forgiveness of Sins The return of Jesus to Capernaum from the surrounding country excited the attention which would be expected after the momentous events of the last Sabbath he spent in the town. To the many accounts which were circulated from house to house and discussed at the corners of the streets was added the amazing story of the healing of the leper. It was not long before Peter's house at Bethsaida was once more the centre of attraction. Those who had waited in vain when Jesus had failed to return to the city after the early morning spent in prayer were joined by many others who had come to hear and see this new rabbi who had set Galilee aflame. There were scribes and Pharisees too who were anxious to observe him more carefully. During the first Sabbath at Capernaum they had been swept along in the general enthusiasm, but now they had had time to think and to consider his teaching. Moreover, it was necessary, they reminded themselves, in view of their responsible status, to assess their own position. Away from the compelling power of his presence, their ardour cooled. They recognised in his teaching a studied disregard for legal righteousness. This was confirmed by reports that multiplied from Judea, they realised that if they were generous in their support of this rabbi, they would incur the displeasure of the temple authorities to whom they owed their religious vocation. When Jesus therefore addressed the multitudes that filled Peter's house and overflowed into the street outside, there was a sudden stir in the crowd and a path was reverently opened up towards the house as a number of scribes and Pharisees made their dignified passage to the forefront. What their attitude would have been had the discourse proceeded on its normal course, we shall never know, because a sudden interruption changed the whole scene. Four friends of a poor man suffering from the dreaded disease of palsy were convinced that if they could get the sick man to Jesus, he would be cured. When they approached the house, they saw at once how difficult their task was going to be. It was impossible even to reach the door. They might have waited for the discourse to finish and for Jesus to come out of the house, but great need does not brook delay, and great faith overcomes every difficulty. Most houses in Palestine had flat roofs, which were approached from the outside by stone steps. There was no difficulty in carrying the sick man up. As the roof was usually made of rubble or hard earth and paved with bricks, it is unlikely that the men made any attempt to break it, which would have been a dangerous and senseless action. It is most likely that Jesus was speaking from the portico of the house, which was covered by a lightly constructed canopy. This they removed, and when the hole was large enough, they gently lowered the sick man until he lay at the feet of the Lord. The interruption was dramatic. All eyes were turned upwards as the hole appeared and was gradually enlarged. The mat and its burden appeared and slowly descended until it rested on the ground. Then the palsied man's wondering eyes found the object of their quest. They looked into the eyes of Jesus. Beholding him, the man became oblivious of the hot, crowded place, of his friends peering down intently from above, even of the illness which had emaciated his once strong frame. He was conscious only of Jesus and of his own sinfulness. Probably his sickness was the direct result of a sinful life. His friends had brought him in faith, but he had come in penitence, and looking now into the strength and holiness of the eyes that held his, his sense of despair, 
despairing unworthiness, and with it his fears increased an hundredfold. But Jesus was lifting him up to something higher than he had ever known. He began to understand how much his need was of the Spirit, and how little of the body. When he made his request, it was not, Lord, make me whole. It was, Lord, forgive. But this was a silent colloquy. The tense watchers heard nothing of it until Christ's final answer. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. The tension broke. The sick man felt the comfort of the peace which flowed through his whole being. But in that company many strange emotions stirred. The faith of the bearers, the relief of the stricken man, the astonishment and wonder of the people, the prejudice and opposition of the scribes. Many who watched the scene had witnessed Christ's healing power and had no doubt that the man would be healed in view of this spectacular demonstration of faith. But they were totally unprepared for these words by which Jesus showed them the true significance of this and every other miracle he performed. In offering men forgiveness, Jesus occupied a province which had been the prerogative of God, but he was about to justify his assumption of this office. The people may have accepted this, but to the scribes it was a challenge which could not be ignored. The sick man may be satisfied, but they were not. Yet they did not speak. They kept their thoughts to themselves veiled behind expressionless faces. Jesus turned his attention upon them. His gaze searched their hearts. Now grace turned to judgment. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? The scribes were not wrong in questioning whether it could be possible that God had delegated his power to forgive sins to this man. They were wrong in defying the evidence that he was continually offering to prove it. Jesus had not forgotten the cripple at his feet. He would have healed him in any case. Now, however, he accommodated his healing to their folly, not so much for their benefit as for the people who stood by. Once more he showed them his authority. It would have been equally ineffective for them to say to the diseased man, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Take up thy bed. Although in the first case their ineffectiveness would not be seen, in the second it would be manifest by the invalid's inability to respond. But for the Son of Man it was no more difficult to forgive sins than it was to heal. True, they could not in the nature of things see the effect of the first, but they could see the result of the second, and that proved the validity of the first. Turning to the man at his feet, the word of command rang out, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. Immediately the man rose, and walking through the wandering throng that made way for him, returned home peaceful in mind and whole in body. All who had witnessed the scene wondered greatly, and glorified God. The opposition of the scribes and Pharisees was still born. It was attacked and defeated at its source. But Jesus knew that the conflict had only begun. Very shortly, supported by men specially sent from Jerusalem, it would flare up into unremitting warfare, and doors now hospitably open would close at his approach. He had come to do his Father's will, and it should be accomplished at whatever cost. Purposefully he travelled the lonely road of self-sacrifice and hardship, deterred neither by the hatred of his enemies nor the solicitude of his friends. 
The connection between sin and suffering was often misunderstood by the people of Christ's day. If a man suffered, it was the direct result of a specific sin. This was one of the few current errors which Jesus stepped aside to correct. But in a general sense, suffering and death are the result of sin, and one of the mysteries of suffering is that so many godly characters are its victims. The association between forgiveness of sins and freedom from suffering is, in this general sense, a very real one. In the case of this palsied man, the interval between forgiveness and restoration was short. It was in Christ's purpose that it should be so. In many, many cases it is extended, sometimes for years. There are those who endure a life of suffering, and death overtakes them as a merciful release. But whether the interval be long or short, whether indeed it never come at all in mortal life, the words of the psalmist remain true. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. For that man, whatever his physical state, there is peace and harmony in this life, and the glorious expectation of ineffable joy in the day of restoration, when the reconciliation which Christ achieved by his death finds its complete fulfilment in the kingdom of which he preached on the hills of Galilee.